Hello and welcome back to the Digital Health and Wearables series. Today I have another magnificent guest and leader for you. But before I go ahead, let me acknowledge our partners, the series partner VMware and the global partner Spirit Digital. And also subscribe to this magnificent content and share with your communities in healthcare. But I'm extremely delighted and excited to have Liz Ashel Payne. She is the chief executive at Orca. Liz, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak with you. No, it's brilliant to have you here. We know each other for such a long time and actually we met in person again after such a long time last week in London, wasn't it? Yeah, it was fantastic. Absolutely wonderful to see people in the flesh. Yeah. And today we're going to discuss mm -hmm. Elf Apps, which is your uh, the great work that you've been doing for such a long time. And I'm going straight to the questions. Is that okay? Absolutely. So the first question that I have for you is, what are the main barriers for Elf App innovators? Okay, so there's a number of barriers to the adoption of digital health solutions. So just to start with, um, to give you a, a, a sense of the size um, of the world of digital health apps. And when I use the word app, I'm not just talking about apps on the App Store. I'm also talking about digital health platforms, so digital health at large. So we currently have access to over 365,000 digital health technologies. A lot of them are on the app stores, but some of them, as I said, are web-based solutions. And every day, 5 million people will download one of these digital health technologies. And we've seen a massive increase in adoption since the start of COVID. Um, now, the problem with that picture is that only 20% of those digital health technologies are safe and compliant with regulations. And so what that means is that there's a mistrust and that mistrust isn't just for us as end users, but it's also for us as healthcare systems and healthcare professionals. Now, the biggest barrier is obviously trust. Um, if you can't trust the solution, you're not going to recommend it to your patients. That's my background. I'm clinical. If you're a system owner and you don't trust a solution, you're not going to reimburse it or commission it. Um, but there are some other problems that come before trust. So one of the big challenges is people aren't aware that these solutions even exist. So if you go out into the street and ask um, a person how many digital health technologies are there, they won't be able to tell you. You'll get a range of 10 to 10 million. People just don't even know that these solutions exist. And that's the same for our healthcare systems and healthcare professionals. The next big problem is then access. Once you become aware that these solutions exist, where do you go to find them? And you might think, oh, well, I'll go to the App Store and maybe type in a word like dementia and you'll see that you'll get a couple of results, but you certainly won't get access to the full 6,000 digital health technologies. So if you're an innovator, how do you emerge from this noise? Once you find a solution, the next challenge is trust. And then the fourth big barrier is ongoing governance and reimbursement. So we don't yet have a process for managing, or we do because this is what Orca do, but most systems don't have a, um, an infrastructure that allows for recommendation and a safe future governance and a reimbursement back at point of prescription. And that's really where we need to get to to achieve sustainability and scalability. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, Liz. Thanks for highlighting this. I mean, the barriers and so, so important for people to, to recognize and get the awareness. And the leading up to the second question is, how can the innovators overcome these barriers? Yeah, so it's tricky. Um, the first thing I'd say is you're going to need a lot of tenacity and resilience. Um, it's not just a silver bullet. But the way in which you can first start this journey is by building trust in your digital health technology. And the reason that's important is because trust is the biggest barrier. And how do we build trust? Well, we're able to prove whether a digital health technology is safe and regulatory compliant. And that's the first stage on trust. The second thing that you can do as an innovator is really think through what is the problem you're trying to solve and who is experiencing that problem so that you can have real clarity of message. So there's a real myth at the moment that one size will fit everybody. And what I mean by that 
is we get asked sometimes, oh, what's the best diabetic um, app or what's the best mental health app? And the answer is it depends. And it depends on a whole range of different things, maybe on age, demographic profile, whether somebody has access to funding. And so you need to be really specific in who it is you're trying to help and who will get the benefit. And then the final thing is make sure that your business model is congruent with the problem you're trying to solve and who pays for your solution might not be the person who receives the benefit. So mapping out clearly the stakeholders of who you want to support and who will be the reimburser for your solution. Oh, brilliant, Liz. And you mentioned before the reimbursement, the great work that you are doing. The systems are not up to scratch yet. I mean, in Germany, for example, as you know, they're making big strides about actually prescribing health apps. In here, in UK, we're starting as well. And you mentioned over 300,000 solutions. I remember a few years ago, it was 200,000, and maybe in the last two, three years, it just nearly, nearly doubled, or at least I've done another 50%, which is incredible. And the last third and last question that I have for you is, where do you see reimbursement in the prescription of health apps going in the future? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, you mentioned um, Germany and what they've done is they've got two pieces of the jigsaw puzzle in place, but there's other pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that are required. So they've obviously created the DIGA, which is the standard so that people can trust a product once it's met that standard. And they've also passed a law that says at point of prescription, um, a health insurer will pay for that product and reimburse it. There's a big chunk missing in the middle, and that chunk is really the infrastructure that allows for safe prescription or recommendation with governance that will allow scale and pace. So in Germany at the minute, if you want to access a DIGA product, there's about five touch points with paper between you, your doctor, your health insurer and back. And quite often that is a, there's a breakdown and it's not scalable. And so for us, what we're trying to do is create that infrastructure. And we, this is what we do, is we create that infrastructure for the safe prescription of products at scale and pace to allow for that reimbursement to flow. And I think that, you know, um, a system like Germany, it's amazing. They've got two of those big pieces of the jigsaw puzzle in place and different systems have different pieces of the jigsaw puzzle in place. But the final um, bit of that jigsaw puzzle, which I've not mentioned yet, which I really want to touch on, is workforce development. If you think about a doctor prescribing a drug, they go through years and years of training before prescribing a drug. And we're not providing that infrastructure. And that's absolutely critical. So one of the things that we've done within our infrastructure is create the Digital Health Academy, which is all CPD accredited learning so that a healthcare professional can learn about these solutions before they recommend it, because that's absolutely critical in that culture shift and change management. Oh, brilliant. Liz, you mentioned that I mean, digital skills are very, very important and you're doing so, so, so great work with that regard, covering several important areas and gaps. Let me congratulate you on your work. And I've been seeing, you know, we met each other probably back in 2015, 2016, I think. And we follow each other's work. And Liz, thank you so much for your time, for your expertise. And let me congratulate you on your magnificent work. And I finish all my episodes in a peculiar way. It's not a question as such. It's called one minute of fame. So you can mention anything, personal life, professional achievements, orca, clients, anything shout out to clients to anything whatsoever to round up over to you one minute of fame wow thank you i wasn't expecting that question um but i i mean there's so many people to say thank you to but who i'm going to thank is the team at orca they are all passionate about the mission of improving lives through digital health and they work so thoroughly in making sure that what we provide is super high quality. They always go above and beyond. And at Orca, we're not just a team, we're a family. Um, so just a big shout out to them and obviously all the partners that we work with. Brilliant. Liz, thank you so much. I'm going to round up now. To all our viewers and listeners, make sure you subscribe, share this content, acknowledge our series partner, VMware and the global partner Spirit Digital also connect with Liz and their magnificent work at Orca. I'm going to post their Twitter in here and their LinkedIn 
Make sure you follow our work and connect with us. And I'll see you all next week.